Hello everyone, this is Mr. Reese, and this video is going to focus on the rational root theorem. However, I should note that we also cover some subtopics in this video, um, namely these five. So you'll see a lot of overlap with some other subjects in um, other sections. Let's first focus on this particular problem here. Let's say you were supposed to solve for x. Notice that it's third degree. Because of that, we can expect three answers. Typically, when you get a problem like this, what you'll want to do is you'll want to try to factor by grouping. Take these first two terms, factor out x squared. For these second two terms, you'll notice that we can take a 9 out. And I want to note that the negative should come out as well if the first term is negative. And we have x plus 2 again. So we can group this because of the fact that we have the same binomial, one on the left, one on the right. Okay, so let's group this. Going further, we are left with these two binomials, and what we can do now is we can use the zero product rule, which basically states that we can, sta we can set each binomial equal to zero and then solve for x independently. So there's the first one, x squared minus 9 is equal to zero. If you add 9 and then square root, you get plus or minus 3. The second grouping, x plus 2, set it to zero and you get negative 2. And those are our solutions. Now a word of note, why uh, when we group this together we got x plus 2 and not x plus 2 squared. Consider this scenario right here. If you have x squared y minus 9y and you wanted to factor it out, well we could factor out each of the y's here and here. And that would leave us with x squared minus 9 times y. Well that's the scenario that we actually have here only difference is this is your y, x plus 2. So the x plus 2 was factored out from both groupings. If you were to take this x plus 2 and distribute back to the 9 and to the x squared, we would have the same stuff as above. So that's the reason why the grouping works, and that's why this isn't squared. So what if you get a problem in which you can't use grouping? Well, then that's when we use the rational root theorem. So say we have this problem here. If you tried to group, we take out x squared from the first two. Here only a negative one comes out. And you'll notice these two binomials are not the same. That's what prevents us from using grouping. So we're going to have to uh, factor this out on our own using synthetic division. Our hope ultimately is to have three groups, and it's three because the degree is three. And what we're going to do is we're going to find each group one at a time. The trick when using synthetic division is that you try a number here, and we want to get zero for a remainder. So yes, you'll need to do trial and error. When you plug in values, well, we can pretty much plug in anything. But the question is this. What number goes here? And how do we figure that out? We don't just randomly guess, do we? What you're going to need to do is you're going to need to generate a list of numbers. That list comes from the constant and the leading coefficient. Determine those factors and then write a ratio. In other words, the last number on top, first number on the bottom. Keeping that idea in mind, the possible rational roots that we could use to plug in here would be 5, in this case, and 1, since 1 divides into 5, 1 and 2 on the bottom, since both divide into 2. So consider all these little combinations, 1 over 1, 5 over 1, 1 over 2, 5 over 2. And this is what we get here. So it is one of these eight values that you'll want to try in here. Let's say you chose negative 1. Well, using synthetic division, it would be 2 plus nothing, which is 2. And then whatever is down here multiplies to negative 1. So I'll just finish this off. And in the end, you'll notice we get 8 for a remainder. Now, we want a remainder of 0. Because the remainder is not 0, that means negative 1 doesn't work for us. Let's try negative 5. Going through the process, you'll notice that with negative 5, this time we wind up with a remainder of 0. So negative 5 is a keeper, and what that means is that that is one of our solutions, and we got two more to go. Now here's what we don't do. We don't choose another number to go here and then try the same set of numbers again. Doing so actually can be rather long and tedious, and what we want to do is we want to cut down our time, especially since the rational root theorem can take so long. As it turns out, this portion of the rational root theorem is done. We really don't need to do synthetic division anymore. 
And the reason is this. Our answer here is a quadratic because of the fact that it's one degree less than what we began with. We can factor this one on, on our own. As a sidebar, I want to remind you that negative 5 was one of our answers, so x minus negative 5 was a factor. If you were to multiply this together, you would get the original problem. Please don't multiply it back. Remember, our idea is to break this apart. We have one part, and now we can break this into two more. So factoring this quadratic gives us this, and then using the zero product rule, set this group equal to zero and solve. Same thing for this group. And those are our solutions. And then, of course, the negative 5 from up here. We mustn't forget that. Now, of course, this process in the beginning takes a while, which is why you'd rather try grouping first and use this as a last resort for factoring any polynomial. OK, now let's try this in the context of a graph. One of the things that you have to do in a graph is determine what the intercepts are. So we'll focus on the x-intercepts first. So let's first determine the possible rational zeros. Remember, that's the factors of the last number, the constant, over the factors of the first number, the leading coefficient. So basically this group. Now when you take all these different combinations, 1 over 1, 2 over 1, 3 over 1, 1 over 2, etc., we get this wonderful list. So now you're thinking, well, OK, there's my synthetic division set up. I'll just try one number at a time and see if I can get 0. I'll do this until eternity. Well. There is a way to help kind of narrow down what, how we should guess. That's Descartes' rule of signs. And basically it states this. If you want to know how many positive real roots there are, what you do is you just simply count the number of sign changes. So examine, this is positive, that's positive, that's not a change. But from a positive to a negative, that is a change. And negative to negative, there's no other changes. So that means there is one positive real root. So what about negatives? Well, for negatives, you're going to have to determine f of negative x. So plugging in negative x wherever you see x, what we get is this. And note that the odd numbered powers, x cubed in this case, and x, the signs for these terms are the ones that change. So the ones with the even number powers like 4, still the same. Same thing for squared, but the x cubed and the x, what was negative is now positive, what was positive is now negative. So what about the changes? Well, this is positive to negative, so that's one change. And then still negative, and then negative back to positive is a change, and then positive back to negative again is a change. So that's three negative real roots. I need to underscore, though, that it is possible to be or one negative real zero, and the reason being is because we could have imaginaries or complex uh, answers, and those always come in pairs. So we count down. One is really the maximum, just as three is the maximum. However, we wouldn't say one or zero because, again, the imaginaries, they always occur in pairs. Okay. So should we be trying positives or negatives? Well, let's assume there are more negatives, which means we should only be trying negative numbers because we'll have a greater chance of getting one of them. I'll try negative 3. If we tried negative 3 using synthetic division, we wind up with a zero remainder, so this is our solution. So here's a question for you. Since now we have x cubed instead of x squared, can we factor by grouping? Unfortunately, no, so we're going to have to use synthetic division to break this down again. And we keep going until we hit x squared. So again, we need another number. However, we don't need to choose from this field because remember that these numbers are determined by the last number over the first number. The last number is negative 6 this time. So that's our list, or in other words, these numbers. So we know not to try 9 or 18 or... Uh, 9 halves. Let's try negative 3 again. As it turns out, negative 3 works again. Sometimes that happens. Okay, so now look at what we've got. We are now down to a quadratic. We can factor this on our own. So our x-intercepts are negative 1 half, 2, and then also don't forget that we got negative 3. In fact, we got it twice. 
Okay, let's take these x-intercepts and let's graph them. Before we continue, I want to again underscore that we got this one twice, and then each of these one time. And that'll be more important later on. Okay, let's get the uh, y-intercept. That means plugging in 0 for x. And we wind it with negative 18. This was actually relatively easy. If you plug in 0 for x, that eliminates every single term here, leaving you with just this value. Let's go ahead and graph that. And now let's worry about the uh, end behaviors. The leading coefficient is our next concern. In this case, you'll notice that it is 2. In other words, it's positive, which means in the end, and I mean on the right side, it's going to end going upward. So let's just draw that in. The degree you'll notice is 4, which means that it's even. Therefore, it's going to be the same in that since we're ending upward, in the beginning it's also going to be upward. Okay, so I've drawn that in. Recall that the maximum number of turns that this graph will have will be the degree minus 1. That's 4 minus 1, which is 3. So we'll have three turns. So how do we finish this up? Well, let's go back to the intercepts. You'll notice that we had negative 3 twice. Because of the fact that you had it twice, at negative 3, this graph is going to bounce. And then for the others, it'll just simply pass through. Again, if you get a number twice, it's just simply going to bounce off that number. And one way you want to think of it is like this. What if you had x squared? What would the graph for x squared would look like? Well, it would look like a parabola, and that's kind of what you're seeing there. x to the 1. What kind of graph is x to the 1? Well, it's a line, and that's what you're seeing going through that point. That's what you're seeing going through that point. It's like a line. So a subtle little hint there on the behavior of the graph. In any case, that does it for this one. That's it for this one. I'll see you next time.